Well, all right, here we are again. Okay, so let me get everything open and we'll get started. Uh, let's see, where are we? <clears throat> all right, so we were partially uh, through 4A. And so when we're done with that, of course, we'll move on to 4B. So we start here with, let's see, we left off, we actually just barely started to look at supply. We were completely done with demand, if I remember correctly. And so we went through, of course, last time, and we introduced the concept of demand, and we looked at the different factors that affect demand. And um, so now we're ready for supply. Of course, supply is coming from the producers. Demand comes from the consumers. Supply comes from the sellers or producers of the good. And of course, their motivations are very different than consumers. Consumers are trying to do only one thing, and that's maximize their well being based on what they're buying. And they want to get maximum value for their dollars. The sellers or producers, of course, are trying to make money. Okay, so they're, they're doing this, they're in this market for a very different reason. So the factors that influence supply are going to be very different than the factors that affect demand. All right, so um, what are we looking at here? The factors that determine supply, as usual, there's quite a few of them. So we'll take a brief look at some of these, productivity, uh, input prices. Now here, the word input prices is meant to indicate the cost of buying um, resources in order to use goods and services. So this would include things like wages paid to labor, uh, rent paid for capital, uh, or sorry, rent paid for land, and interest paid for capital. So in other words, anything that goes into the production of your product belongs in this category. And we'll look at it in more detail in a minute. Um, we also have the prices of goods, what we'll call related in production, and we'll discuss this as we go along. But this is uh, analogous to what we saw when, when we talked about substitutes and complements. The difference is that before we were looking at substitutes and complements in consumption, these are going to be substitutes and complements in production. And we'll explain that when we get to that point. We also have expectations. Now you notice this, this one actually shows up in both supply and demand. Consumers have expectations about what's going on in the future as do the sellers. And they'll base their behavior partially at least on those expectations. And so now finally we see the number of sellers of a good. So we have the number of buyers of a good in the demand category. So here we also have the number of sellers in the supply category. So let's take a look at these one at a time. Now productivity refers to the efficiency, the key word there is efficiency, with which resources can be converted into goods and services. Obviously higher productivity reduces our cost of production and that means more goods can be um, provided at a profitable rate by the sellers. Okay, so productivity, in fact, a lot of our uh, gains in our standards of living are driven by productivity gains. Um, as you obviously know, as technology advances, um, it becomes cheaper and cheaper to produce high-tech items like computers and phones and all the rest. And so productivity is an extremely important determinant of our standards of living because it directly determines the cost of producing goods and services. And by the way, this is not just for high tech products, for all products, productivity is very important. The more you can squeeze out of your resources, obviously the more you can sell and the more choices consumers will have as well as the lower the prices. So this is an important detail. Actually, the government does keep track of productivity growth. And you know it goes through cycles, but in general, productivity tends to grow fairly rapidly when the economy is doing well. And often if the economy is slumping, part of the reason for that is because productivity growth is slowing down. Input prices. So this is again, the cost of producing your good or service. So uh, we have wages, we have raw materials, um, that type of thing. Like for example, with Starbucks, which we've been looking at as an example, for them, this would include the wages that they pay to their employees, uh, the cost of things like electricity for the store, um, the rent on their stores, uh, property taxes, 
uh, you name it, it goes into the cost of producing coffee. Um, we also have supplies like coffee beans and milk and all this and that. So all of these are considered to be input prices. And when input prices go up, this obviously is going to eat into the profits of the firm, and that's going to make it much more difficult for them to produce their product. So when input prices go up, um, this typically leads to a reduction in the supply of whatever this good happens to be, simply because it's becoming more expensive to produce it. Uh, now, this is an interesting one. We have to think about this one carefully. Uh, and again, we mentioned these words the other day. Uh, we had substitutes and complements, but <clears throat> those were substitutes and complements in consumption. What does it mean for two goods to be substitutes in production or complements in production? It's a similar idea. Um, substitutes in production are goods that could be produced with the same resources. So um, obviously we're going to always choose the one that provides us with the highest uh, revenues. So here's an example of that. How about a farmer? I think we use this example too. Suppose that a farmer can grow either wheat or corn with the exact same resources. You can imagine what will happen if corn goes up in the marketplace, the price of corn goes up, he's going to want to switch his production out of wheat and into corn. Okay, so that means the supply of corn will go up, but at the same time, though, the supply of wheat will go down because he can't produce more of both. All right, in other words, in the short run, at least, there's a direct trade off, as we know, between producing one good versus another. If he wants more corn, he has to reduce his output of wheat. So corn and wheat would be defined as substitutes in production, meaning that unlike with uh, consumption, where these are two goods that you are equally happy consuming, here these are products or goods that we can produce with more or less the same resources. And so we have to choose how much of each to produce based on the market prices at which we can sell them. All right. Now compliments, this is interesting because you don't, it's hard to find a good examples of this. Um, as you can probably guess, remember what compliments were uh, with consumption. These are goods that tend to be consumed together like French fries and ketchup. How does that work here? Well, for certain types of products, um, in the, while you're producing one product, other products may be created as a byproduct of that uh, product. For example, here, it turns out that when oil companies drill for oil, a lot of times the oil wells also contain natural gas. So if let's say ExxonMobil goes out and starts drilling for oil, they will by almost by accident also find themselves um, acquiring a large amount of natural gas because natural gas apparently does find itself in these wells. And so when you produce oil, you're also simultaneously producing natural gas. And so we call those complements in production because they result from the same production process. Now, I, one other example I thought of one day, which probably, it might make sense to you. If you ever go to the store and you see all the different kinds of milks that are available, you know, you've got the heavy cream and you've got whole milk and you've got 2%, you've got 1%. Ultimately, all of those products are coming from the same milk. In other words, if you produce a gallon of milk, um, what happens is it contains heavy cream. And in fact, if you let it sit there for a while, the heavy cream will set, uh, rise to the top of the milk and it can be skimmed off and sold as a separate product. Maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. So, um, so yes, the heavy cream is not a separate product. It's part of the whole milk that is being produced by the cows. But um, what happens is the producers of the milk can strip out the uh, heavy cream and sell it as a separate product. So you could think of heavy cream and milk as being complements in production. But again, the idea is that when you make one product, you're basically also making the other product. <clears throat> okay, and so naturally enough, if like imagine this scenario, uh, ExxonMobil is drilling for oil. And let's say the price of oil stays the same, but natural gas suddenly becomes much more expensive. Well, then they're going to drill more oil wells in order to get at the natural gas. Even if they don't need the oil, they will like to produce more so that they can get at the natural gas, which is becoming more expensive. 
okay? So the price of the natural gas will directly influence how much oil ExxonMobil is willing to uh, produce. Now, how about um, expectations? Now, when do you want to sell a product? When the price is as high as possible. So if you have reason to believe that whatever it is you're selling will become more expensive in the future, you may decide to hold back on that production this year and increase your output in the future. All right, so let's say, and oil companies are constantly being accused of doing something like this, trying to manipulate the market, they hold back their supply and all this and that. But I mean, if you're a farmer and you're producing oranges and you're turning into orange juice, you may decide that if you really believe that the price of orange juice will be higher in the future, you may sell or be, you may want to sell less of it today and store the rest of it and sell it in the future when the price does in fact go up. If it does, you might be wrong, but if you really believe that, you might decide to reduce your output this year and increase it in the future in order to take advantage of the expected higher price. But, but of course, the opposite is possible too. You may realize or you may think that in the future, um, that let's say more uh, farmers are growing oranges than ever before, and you have reason to believe that orange juice prices will fall in the future, you may want to produce as much as possible now while the, still, the prices are still relatively high. Okay, so in other words, if you see that prices are going down in the future, you'll want to make more of that product today to take advantage of the fact that the prices are still relatively high. So you can see how this can influence your thinking about how much you should produce of your product today. All right, and again, this is very much analogous to what happens with consumers who think that the price of a good might be higher or lower in the future that will influence how much they buy today. All right, so if you think something's going on sale, you may wait to buy that product. But if you think the price is going up, you may buy more of it today. It's the same exact situation here. And then the number of sellers, obviously if more people or more companies come into a market, more of a product will be produced. So for example, if another hamburger chain starts up to compete with McDonald's and Burger Kings and all the rest, then clearly the supply of hamburgers will go up. So this is just like with the number of consumers in demand, as the number of sellers goes up, the supply goes up. If companies leave the business though, they leave the industry, clearly with fewer sellers, the supply has to go down. So let's say uh, McDonald's, or not McDonald's, let's say um, one of those small ones that you see advertising on TV all the time goes out of business, mm -hmm. then the supply of hamburgers would actually have to go down, of course. Anyway, so we're gonna bring all these together and produce what we'll call a supply curve. Just like we had a demand curve, we have to have a supply curve. Now, we start this with a chart and we'll use the same example of pizza that we had last time. So let's look at this thing. We have the so-called supply schedule and let's take a look and see what we notice about these numbers. Oh, now look at this. The price here is going up and what's happening to the quantity that's being supplied to the market? It's also going up, why? Because it's more and more profitable to produce pizzas when the price is going up. So that's why this happens. The higher the price, the more profitable it is to produce pizzas <clears throat> and therefore the more of them will be produced. So as you can imagine, Unlike the demand curve, which has a negative slope, the supply curve will actually have a positive slope. Okay, and that's what it looks like. It starts at zero and it goes up. You can see it's a very simple graph. Um, it has a positive slope, which indicates that as I produce, or as the price goes up in this direction, the amount that I'm willing to produce or sell it goes up as well. So we have a positive slope. <clears throat> okay, so that's the supply curve. So just to summarize now, I just wanna put in another slide here just to summarize what we've been doing here as far as supply and demand are concerned. Um, let's see. 
So the demand curve shows the maximum price that uh, consumers are willing to pay for every possible quantity of a good. The demand curve is downward sloping because people are willing to pay to buy less and less of the good as the price rises. Okay, so that's our summary of the uh, demand curve. Now the supply curve, we could think of it this way. <clears throat> the supply curve shows the minimum price that sellers are willing to, at, at which producers are willing, or let's think about it this way, the minimum price that, at which sellers are willing to provide every possible quantity of a good. The supply curve is upward sloping because uh, sellers are willing to produce more and more of a good as the price rises. And I'll put in parentheses due to the higher profits that arise at higher prices. Okay. Okay, so that's all we need. Now, what do we, now, of course, we've been uh, treating supply and demand in isolation from each other. Now, for the first time, we're going to bring them together and see what happens when the two of them interact with each other. Okay, so we're going to introduce <clears throat> what is probably the most important concept in all of economics, and that's equilibrium. Now, in general, the word equilibrium simply means there's a balance of some kind. And it pops up in many different disciplines. Um, you probably ran into it in other areas like high school chemistry, for example. But here, it simply means that we've reached a point where the quantity being supplied, oh, that's okay, um, equals the quantity demanded. In other words, the amount that's being produced in the market exactly matches what consumers are willing to buy. And that's a very happy situation because everybody's happy when both sides agree, this is the amount that we will sell and this is the amount that we will buy. <clears throat> okay, so what I've done here is I've put together the two um, cur I mean, sorry, the two charts into one big new chart where I'm showing the supply schedule and the demand schedule so that we can figure out, in our example, where does this take place? Okay, so let's check this out. Um, we'll bring these together. And by the way, you notice how I'm using Q with the subscript S for quantity supplied and Q with the subscript D for quantity demanded. When we don't need to make a distinction between the two, we'll simply use the letter Q. But here we do not have to know which is which. So I've, I've made this easier too by using this yellow line to show you. Now, this is the supply schedule that we had earlier a few minutes ago. This is the uh, demand schedule that we had the other day. And this is the price, of course. And so you notice, again, as the price goes up, the quantity supplied is going up. The quantity demanded, though, is going down. And you'll notice that because they're both straight lines, they have to cross at some point, And that point happens to be $10. So at a price of $10, the producers are willing to sell 5 million pizzas and the consumers are willing to buy 5 million pizzas. And if you notice, this is the only price at which this is happening. Like at the very low prices, for example, consumers wanna buy a lot of pizza, but the sellers only wanna produce a small amount of pizza because they're not making any money here. They're not very much. Whereas down here, it's the other way around. Man, the sellers are happy to sell a lot of pizzas at $18 each, but very few people are willing to buy them at $18. So what we're aiming for is that point, that one point where the two are exactly equal to each other. 
And that's what we mean by equilibrium. This is the equilibrium price, and this is the equilibrium quantity. Okay, so that's what they're called, the equilibrium price and the equilibrium quantity. Now we can see this from our chart, but it's often easier to see this with the graph. We're gonna to bring together the two curves, the supply and the demand curve, and what we're looking for is the point where they cross. So you can see, just like in the chart, they cross here, we're gonna call this point E for equilibrium. And this is where the price is $10 and the quantity is 5 million. And so we say here, the quantity supplied equals the quantity demanded, and this is equilibrium. <clears throat> okay, so this is what we're aiming for. This is an important position because what's nice about equilibrium is that there is no, uh, let me make a note of it down here, at equilibrium, there is no tendency for any changes to take place. In other words, the sellers will continue to make this much pizza and the producer, uh, sorry, the consumers will continue to buy it everybody's happy. They'll, there's no reason to change the amount that's being produced and there's no reason to change the amount that's being consumed because this is what everybody wants. So again, you'll notice that uh, equilibrium actually means balance. Here are the balances between the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded. Well, now you can probably imagine that this may last for a long time and it may not. What could actually throw this off what happens if one of these curves moves? Okay, now if you recall, we saw five or six factors that influence each of these two, supply and demand. If one of those factors changes, then one of these curves will move, and then we have to start all over again with a new equilibrium, uh, new equilibrium price and new equilibrium quantity. And so as you can imagine, supply and demand conditions can change literally on a daily basis. And so this equilibrium may not last for very long. That depends on the particular market. Some markets, conditions are more stable than others. If this was a product, not like pizza, let's say, but for some high tech product where they're constantly improving it, um, then you might see the curve shifting around more often. But for something like pizza, yeah, I mean, let's face it, everybody loves pizza. This supply and demand shouldn't change very often so this may last for a very long time. In fact, I'm sure you can think of products that you've seen in the supermarket where the price basically never changes. That's because most likely some type of equilibrium has been reached and so everybody's happy, so there's no reason to change the price. On the other hand, there are products where the price is constantly changing, which means that these curves are probably shifting around for some reason. So this is our equilibrium. Now, um, what happens if we're not in equilibrium? It's not necessarily the case that we're always in equilibrium. In fact, we frequently are not. It's not necessarily the case that the pizzerias are charging $10. For example, what if for some reason the pizzerias are only charging $8? Let's jump ahead and look at that example. Um, right here. All right, here it is. So then we'll take a step back and explain what's going on here. Suppose the pizzerias aren't fully clear about what's going on in the market for pizza. And they set a price of $6 because they're not sure how much people really want to buy. And look what happens. Now at such a low price, people are excited to buy pizza. It's only $6. So this is my quantity demanded, seven, seven million actually. This is my quantity supplied, 3 million. Now you can see there's a problem here, isn't there? What is that problem? Are we happy? Is everybody happy? No. 
the quantity demanded of 7 million, and you can tell because it comes from the demand curve. Uh, oh, here we go. Yes, good. That's right. Exactly. People want more pizza than is being produced. Exactly. So they're like, well, we want to buy 7 million pizzas, but guess what? They're not available. Oh no, now everybody's unhappy. This vertical dis horizontal distance of 4 million pizzas is referred to as a shortage. It's like, well, and you've, you've, I'm sure you've experienced this yourself. You go to the supermarket to buy something and it's all gone. What happened? And then you realize it was on sale that day and everybody ran in and scooped it all up. So there's not enough left because for that one day or one week or whatever, the price was at an artificially low level. And people responded by scooping it all up. And now for the time being, there's none left. Now, will this shortage last forever? Good question. So let's take a step back here and just remind ourselves that equilibrium simply, I'm sorry, shortage means the market price has fallen below the equilibrium price for whatever reason. And people respond by wanting to buy more of that product than is being produced. And we call that a shortage. The question though, is what happens as a result? In other words, everybody sees this happening. The producers can see that there's a shortage. The consumers can see that there's a shortage. So therefore something has to give. This can't last forever because you know, everybody's not happy right now. So what happens is the sellers begin to realize that, you know what, if there's a shortage, we must be charging too low a price. Okay, the sellers understand how this works. With, with a low price, with such a low price, the sellers will respond by doing what? How do they react to that? Like, wait a minute, all the pieces are flying off the shelves. What can we do about it? And the answer is we can raise our price. It's clear that people wanna buy a lot of pizza. So therefore we'll charge them more. And so the price goes up, I'll write it like this. And when the price starts going up, people cut back on their demand for pizza. They start switching over to other products like fried chicken and hamburgers and all the rest. The quantity supplied goes up and guess what's going to happen? The price goes up, the quantity supplied goes up, the quantity demanded goes down and we'll find ourselves right back where we belong in equilibrium. Okay, so let me just show you how that works on this graph. So um, let me jump ahead here and you can see if I start raising the price, I'm the supplier. If I move up the supply curve with higher prices, the quantity that I'm producing is going up. This, the buyers are seeing this and saying, you know, maybe we don't necessarily need so much pizza and gradually they'll cut back their consumption and they'll end up back here. So they're moving uh, along this curve and this adjustment process will stop when we've returned to equilibrium where everybody is happy. In other words, when we raise our price to $10, we won't raise it to 11 because we can see that now we're in equilibrium. There's no point in raising it to 11. So the seller will keep raising it until this equilibrium has been reached. <clears throat> the consumer will just keep reducing their consumption. And then eventually when they see that there's enough pizza to go around, they'll stop increasing their consumption and everybody will be happy once again. So we'll be back at $10 and the quantity will be at five. <clears throat> now this might take a while or it might happen very quickly. That depends on the market, but this will happen automatically. Okay, so we say that markets are 
self-adjusting in the sense that prices will adjust automatically to eliminate the shortage. Now, we saw a lot of this happening during the COVID crisis because, you know, certain items suddenly became very hard to find, like paper towels, for example. And so what happened was the producers had to um, turn, you know, they had to really crank up their production to make sure that there were enough paper towels. And so um, they basically increased their supply to get rid of all the shortages that were developing. And that was because of panic buying, of course. People suddenly said, "Uh oh, there's a COVID a crisis going on. Maybe we should stock up on necessities, but not just stock up, but like hoard them. And so for a while, it was impossible to get items like paper towels and you know this hand sanitizer stuff. And um, so the producers had to really just churn out more and more products just to eliminate the shortage, but it did eventually happen. It took a while because this was a major disaster, but for a single situation like pizza, this shouldn't take too long. Um, the pizzerias are smart. They know that they're uh, charging too little for the pizza, so they just raise it until they find the right point. Now, in the real world, of course, um, it would be nice if you know the producers were uh, aware of the exact demand curve that they're facing. They may not know exactly what's going on with that demand curve, but they have a pretty good idea. So, you know, let's face it. Um, there's a certain amount of guessing involved, but they're gonna keep tinkering with the price until they find the one that works, okay? They don't have perfect information, so they just keep changing the price and eventually they find the one that makes sense for everybody. Unless now, sometimes you get large corporations have the resources to do a lot of extensive market research and they can determine more or less <clears throat> what the demand is for their product. But for smaller businesses, this is going to be a bit of an issue. They, they have to try instead is just simply adjusting their price until they find the right one. All right, now what about the opposite situation? What if the pizzerias, instead of charging too little money, they, charge, they try to charge too much? What would happen then? Let's jump down here and look at this case. All right, so here the pizzerias are charging $12 not realizing that that's not the equilibrium price. Now, what's happening here, here? Now, all of a sudden, the situation is reversed. The quantity supplied is here, and the quantity demanded is here. <clears throat> and so what's happening is that all of a sudden, they're not selling all the pizza. Up here, the quantity supplied exceeds the quantity demanded. People are not willing to buy all the pizzas that are being produced at $12 each. They're just not because they have other options to choose from like hamburgers and, and all the other stuff. So the pizzerias realize that, you know what? We've got all this extra inventory that's piling up. What do we do about it? Uh-huh. And by the way, you can see the size of the surplus is two. How do you know? Because QS minus QD equals two. And since the quantity supplied exceeds the quantity demanded, this is the surplus. Too much is being produced because the price is so high that people are not willing to buy it all. So what would you imagine is going to happen as, as a result of this? The pizzerias will say, you know what? We've made a mistake. The price is just too high. People are just not willing to pay that much for the pizza. So let's do this. Let's lower the price. We'll move down this, um, oops, it's the supply curve. And as they gradually drop the price, people will come back and buy more and more pizza. So the sellers or pizzerias lower the price. And so as a result, the quantity demanded goes up and the quantity supplied goes down until they're equal to each other again. And that's when they stop lowering the price because now everybody's happy again, right here. The price is 10, the quantity supplied and demanded are both equal to five. 
and that that means we're back in equilibrium. So you know, in the market, you know, there's a constant adjustment going on. Um, anytime we're not in equilibrium, you can rest assured that the prices will be adjusted until we find ourselves back in equilibrium. And this happens all the time. This is a constant ongoing process. So at any random time, you might find that a market is not in equilibrium, but if it's not, it is automatically heading back that way because prices are adjusting. So it's prices that really bring about equilibrium. The fact that they're flexible, um, that the sellers can adjust them to bring us back into equilibrium means that it will happen automatically because their profits will be maximized when we're in equilibrium. Okay, they don't wanna be up here. They're wasting resources. They don't wanna have a shortage either because they're missing out on the opportunity to sell more units. This is where they wanna be. So everybody, like I said, is happy when we're in equilibrium. So there's an automatic tendency in the economy to gravitate towards equilibrium if we're not already there. And this is what I mean by markets being self-adjusting. There's an automatic tendency to move toward equilibrium through adjustments in the price level. <clears throat> okay, so that's what's happening here. Okay, and of course, as I mentioned, I think I mentioned this, when there's too much of a product being produced, we call it a surplus. A surplus is clearly the opposite of a shortage. All right, now that was all 4A. That was chapter 4A. What we're gonna do now for the first time is we're gonna consider what happens in these markets when the curves themselves start shifting around. All right, in other words, even if we're in equilibrium, market conditions can change. If any factor besides the price changes, then all of this can also change. And we're gonna see exactly how that works in 4B. All right, let's look at 4B. So first we're gonna make an important um, distinction here between two types of changes that can take place in the market. This is important, it may seem very subtle, but this is important. The terminology in economics is um, kind of interesting. We start by noting that, and let me draw a little picture of this for you first. Suppose we have a demand curve. And of course it's downward sloping. And let's say if the price of this product is $10, we can sell a hundred units. I'll call that point A. <clears throat> if I drop the price to let's say five, let's say that means that people are willing now to buy 200 units. So when I move up and down this demand curve, the only thing that changed from point A to B is the price of the good changed. So the price changes Everything else uh, is held constant. In other words, only the price change, nothing else, not the number of consumers, not the price of substitutes, just the price. When this happens, we call this movement a change in quantity demanded. So again, anytime we find ourselves moving up and down the same demand curve due to a change in price only, we refer to that in economics as a change in quantity demanded. So we have to be very careful with this. It's a very important uh, definition now. Beautiful, all right, now, what else could there be then? What else could change? How about one of these other factors that we're holding constant? Okay, so with our pizza example, 
Um, if you, if we have, all right, well, I don't have the chart right now, but, um, or actually I do, let me go get it. It's on the other set of slides. Hold on a second. I'm looking for the demand schedule. So suppose that we started out with a price of 12, which implies that people are willing to buy 4 million pizzas. And then I lower the price to 10. That means people are willing to buy 5 million pizzas. So what does that indicate? I'm moving along the same demand curve. And again, because only the price is changing, this is an, again, an example of a change in quantity demanded. And we can tell because we just moved up and down the same curve because of pr the price was changed. Only the price has changed. Not, um, and we'll call it an outside factor. And when I say outside factor, I mean that's something that's not on the vertical axis, like the number of consumers in the marketplace. But what if one of those other factors changes? Ah, that's a much more complicated situation. Suppose, for example, this is a normal good and incomes go up. We already know that people are willing to buy more of a product when their incomes go up if it's normal. What's going to happen here now is that um, if any outside factor changes, the entire demand curve will shift either to the left or the right. We'll see how that works in a few minutes, but the entire curve will move. And that is referred to as a change in demand. Now you notice it's a very subtle distinction. Before we were looking at the change in quantity demanded, now we're gonna call this a change in demand because again, it's something other than the price that's changing. And the consequences of this are that the curve will actually move to a new location. Okay, so how does this happen? What could cause this? Well, you recall that when we derived the demand curve, there were six factors that we were assuming could affect the demand for a product, such as the price of substitutes, the price of complements, income, all this, all this good stuff. So if one of those factors changes in such a way that people want more of a product, then we have what's called an increase in demand, not quantity demanded, an increase in demand and the entire curve shifts to the right, okay? In other words, that would be this case. So for a normal good, um, an increase in income will cause the entire curve to shift to the right. And this is known as an increase in demand. We have more money to spend. We're gonna buy more, let's say cars. Even if the price is higher, we'll still buy more cars than we were before. So in other words, our ability to buy this product has increased. And so we're gonna to wanna to buy more of it at every single price. <clears throat> In fact, why don't I show you another graph that makes this a little more clear. All right, hold on one second. Um, let me do this one more time. So in other words, I'm gonna throw some numbers in here now. So imagine now, here's the demand curve. I'll call it D1 because this is the original demand curve. And let's just say at the price of 10, we're selling hundred units. And then incomes go up, shifts to the shifts to the right. Now, now you see what's happening. If the price, even if it stays at $10, now people are willing to buy 200 of it. And the same thing is true for all the other prices, okay? On the new demand curve,
people will buy more of the product or of the good at every possible price. And that's a result of an increase, as we said before, an increase in demand, which is triggered in this case by an increase in incomes. And again, assuming that it's a normal good. So shift to the right is an increase. And that means that now people are buying more of this product at every possible price. Now, of course, the opposite can happen too. People can stop buying people. Let's say their taste for this product declines. Um, let's say that we're thinking about tobacco and over time people buy less and less tobacco no matter what the price of the product is because they're more and more aware of just how dangerous it is. So let's think about that case. Um, and so you can probably guess what's going to ha happen next. If an increase in demand shifts the demand curve to the right, it stands to reason that a decrease in demand will shift it to the left. Of course it will. Just the opposite. So on the same slide, you can see that a decrease in demand causes the curve to shift to the left because people don't want as much of the good as they used to. Let's say their tastes are changing. This is a product that, you know, they don't want it as much as they did. And it could be a lot of things. It could be like um, fattening foods, let's say. You know, people are more health conscious and so they buy more healthy products and less fatty foods, let's say. So here we have a decrease in demand, which means the entire curve shifts to the left for whatever reason. And now, if you notice, at the same price of, let's say, 10, where we were previously buying 100 units, now all of a sudden we're only willing to buy 50. So on the new demand curve, people will buy less of the good at every possible price. So there's imagine in the new scenario, the, the sellers put it on, on sale, that's fine. People will increase their consumption, but still it'll be less than it was on the original demand curve. And both of these cases that I just showed you um, are collectively known as changes in demand. Okay, so just bear in mind, again, we have to be very careful with our uh, terminology here. Uh, let me just summarize this on the slide here. Okay. Just a quick summary of what I just said. Okay, so the bottom line here is that a changing quantity demanded results from a change in the price of the good. This is reflected as a movement along the curve. A change in demand results from a change in any outside factor. The entire curve shifts as a result. Okay. And of course we noted that uh, when the curve shifts, of course it can either shift to the right or to the left. And in fact, let me add that at the end here, um, a shift to the right indicates an increase in demand. People are willing to buy more of the good at every possible price. Whoops. A shift to the left indicates a decrease 
in demand, people are willing to buy less of the good at every possible price. Okay, so that's a summary of what we've been doing. Now I've got some numerical examples based on the pizza case that we've been looking at. Um, for, oh, let me just fix this too. I prefer certain uh, fonts for my headings. There we go, I like that one. All right, so imagine now we get back to the pizza. So we started out, now we assume pizza is a normal good. Uh, everybody loves pizza. Nobody buys it just because it's cheap, that you buy it because you love it. So therefore, if incomes go up, you would expect people to buy more pizzas and more of every other normal good too. So imagine that incomes in the country go up. The economy is doing great. Everybody's happy. And so what's going to happen is people are willing to buy more pizza at every possible price. So we've got our original demand schedule. And then we have this new one right next to it. And what do you notice about the new uh, demand schedule compared to the original one? What's different now all of a sudden? Well, I've just added two to each one, that's all, just to keep it simple. So the new curve will be um, just two units to the right of the original curve. That's right, exactly. They've all gone up. All right, precisely. Now let's see how that looks graphically. There, whoop, there you go. And you see the two are parallel to each other because it went up by exactly two. And so this uh, curve shifts to the right and don't forget, we call this an increase in demand because something other than the price changed. What was that something? Um, it was incomes. Okay, increase in demand. But I'm sure you can think of a lot of products where this is happening anyway, over time, like for example, organic foods. You know, 20 or 30 years ago, nobody would have paid extra money for any organic foods. I mean, maybe a few people, but now you've got like Whole Foods, for example, and this is one of the ways in which they make their money by having lots and lots of organic products. Even if they're more expensive, that's okay because people are willing to pay more than they were 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so there's an increase in demand for those products. And so the demand curve shifts to the right. Okay, now on the other hand, what if there's a huge recession and people's incomes are falling and they decide that they can't afford to buy quite so many pizzas? It could happen. It's not likely to change too much in the real world because, uh, you know, let's face it, pizza is not all that expensive and you do have to eat. Um, lower incomes would be more likely to impact expensive products like um, cars and computers and TVs and houses. And But let's just say that um, it's happening here too with the pizzas. So I'm going to show you another demand schedule. This time, all the quantities have fallen by two. And this is because of incomes again. Um, people have less income to spend, therefore they buy less pizza. Let's say they eat at home more often. Because let's face it, you and I cannot make pizza at home like they make in the pizzeria, can we? No, we cannot. You can take a shot at it, but it's never going to be the same, is it? No, and you know that from experience. Um, so, if you're very, if you're really worried about your income, you may say, you know, maybe I shouldn't go out so often and buy pizza. Maybe I should stay at home and do something, cook something myself. So the the amount that we're willing to buy has fallen, and so the entire demand curve this time will shift to the left. And again, because of the way I subtracted exactly two from each. Um, quantity, the two curves are parallel, but it doesn't have to work that way. So this is what we call a decrease in demand. And again, it is triggered by an outside factor other than the price. In this case, it was income. Okay. So any of those many factors we looked at can cause this to happen. 
And what we're eventually going to do is go through them all one at a time and analyze how each of those factors could potentially affect these demand curves. We have to understand how all of them affect the demand. And then we're going to eventually do the same thing for supply. Okay. Now, how does this affect our equilibrium? Good question. So what I want to do is start with the case where the demand increased. So what I've done is brought together the original set of prices. This is my supply schedule. This hasn't changed. Incomes are not one of the factors that influences the supply of the good. The supply of the good is only influenced by the cost of producing that product. Incomes influence the demand of that good. So if incomes go up, people are happy to buy more pizzas and you notice the equilibrium price has jumped up from 10 to $12. All of a sudden at a price of 12, we've reached an equilibrium position where the quantity supplied and the quantity demanded both equal six. Now, how did this happen? Well, I think you'll understand it better when you see the graph. Here we go. Now look what happened. So before we just shifted the demand curve without considering the supply curve, but now because the demand curve shifted, the intersection point will be different. In fact, the two curves will now cross at a higher price and a higher quantity. So we have a new equilibrium point where people are buying more pizza at a higher price. Because they're happy to do so. They love the pizza and they have the money. So they're like, well, what the heck? Well, we want more pizza, even if we have to pay a higher price for it, which they do because the costs of production have not changed. So because this demand curve increased, we have a higher price and a higher quantity. So I'm gonna indicate that with these little arrows. Okay. Uh, okay, so in other words, this is resulting in a higher price, but a higher quantity. The new equilibrium has a higher price and a higher quantity. So you can probably imagine what's coming next. What about the case where the incomes fell? The demand curve shifted to the left. Well, you're probably going to successfully predict that everything will work in reverse. And that's exactly correct. All right, everything goes backwards. So let's see that graphically and with the chart, of course. So let's go back and revisit the supply and demand schedules. But this time, I've got the, um, the same price, same prices, the same supply schedule. But now I've got the demand curve that resulted from lower incomes. In other words, the entire demand curve has shifted to the left. And you can see the new equilibrium price and quantity are lower, okay? Instead of 10, which we started out with, or 12, like we had just a few minutes ago, all of a sudden the equilibrium price is eight and the equilibrium quantity is four. All right, so why don't we see how this works graphically? Now, of course, you can imagine this is the consequence of the demand curve shifting to the left. Okay, so yes, in fact, you're absolutely correct. We started out here in equilibrium in the beginning, and then as a result of this decrease in demand, the equilibrium price and quantity have both fallen. People are uh, unwilling to buy as much pizza. Uh, 
Um, and so therefore the price goes down and the quantity goes down as well. Because at such a low price, it's less profitable for the pizzerias to sell pizza and they'll still make it, but not as much of it. Okay, so you can see these two cases are exactly the opposite of each other. All right, so you should have no trouble whatsoever drawing these graphs. At some point, you want to get a piece of paper and a pen out and start practicing yourself with these graphs because you will have to draw them on your, uh, whenever the first exam rolls around, one of the things you'll have to do is actually draw these curves and show, for example, what happens when there's a change in demand. Okay, so I do want to point out one thing just as a, a little summary here, when the demand changes, or all right, let's put it like this. When demand increases, and, and again, the key detail here is due to a change in an outside factor, the following things happen. The demand curve shifts to the right, and the equilibrium price and quantity increase, both increase, let's put it that way. Okay, so that's what happens when there's an increase in the demand for a product. What about when it decreases? All right, so what I'm gonna do here is uh, cheat a little bit. I'm, whoop, whoop, whoop. I'm just going to edit this one because all, look at all I have to do is when the demand decreases due to a change in an outside factor, the demand curve shifts to the left and the equilibrium price and quantity both decrease. Okay, so this is exactly what we saw with our graphs and our schedules. All right, so now what we have to do is think about what happens with the supply curve. And you can probably see that we're going to shift the supply curve instead of the demand curve. And then we'll see what the impact is on equilibrium. Okay. So now here again, we have to make a very important distinction between the change in quantity supplied versus the change in supply. So a quick reminder, a change in quantity supplied results when the price of the good changes. And that means a movement along the same supply curve. So this is exactly what we saw with demand. Change in quantity supplied means that we're moving up and down the same supply curve because only the price is different. But unlike the demand curve, when the price falls, the quantity supplied goes down. And when the price rises, the quantity supplied goes up. Okay, so let me show you that. Um, so this is taken from the supply schedule for the pizzerias. <clears throat> if we started out with an equilibrium price of um, 10 and quantity of five, if for some reason, let's say that the cost of tomatoes goes up, then we're going to find ourselves moving down the supply curve to this new point where we're charging $8, but only producing four pizzas. So this is a, a change in quantity, quantity supplied. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. I think I said the wrong thing. This is a change in quantity supplied. The price is dropping, not one of the external factors. I said the wrong thing. The tomatoes have nothing to do with this. Change in quantity supplied due to a reduction in the price. Okay, the price falls. Therefore, we respond by making less pizza. 
Okay, we don't know what else happened. All we know is that the price changed. So a change in quantity supplied results from a change in the price only, just like with the demand. This can only happen if the price changes. We're moving up and down the same curve to a new location on that curve. This we call a change in quantity supplied. As opposed to, and I'm sure you know what's coming next, a change in supply, which means that any one of those outside factors could have changed. All right, so just like with the demand curve, if something else besides price changes, the entire curve has to shift. And that's exactly right. So change in supply results when an outside factor, meaning anything other than price, changes. Okay. All right. Now, just like with the demand curve, the curve, the supply curve can shift to the right or to the left. So, and again, the now it's everything's exactly the same. If there's an increase in supply, the curve goes to the right. If there's a decrease in supply for whatever reason, the supply curve shifts to the left. Okay. So this nothing's really changed here. Um, this is an increase in supply. And this is a decrease in supply. Okay, so it's the same thing. A shift to the right is an increase and a shift to the left is a decrease. It's nice that it's, a, it's set up exactly the same. So you, you don't have to memorize a lot of things. It's just, you start to learn to get a sense of where these curves are shifting and why, and that's all you really need. So let's say that now the cost of the tomatoes, now we're ready for the tomatoes. If the cost of the tomatoes changes, let's say that the tomatoes are cheaper. I can make my pizzas for less money. Each pizza costs me less money. So I'm going to be happy to make more pizza because each pizza that I sell, is more profitable. Of course it is. So I'm going to show you the original supply schedule and the new one where once again, just to keep things simple, all I did was shift the curve to the right by two units. Okay, I've added two to each of these quantities. And guess what? As you can probably guess, the supply curve shifts to the right. We call this an increase in supply. And you notice that what changed was not the price of the pizza, but the cost of the tomatoes that are needed to make it. All right, now, obviously you can guess that the opposite will occur if the price of the tomatoes goes up. Then it becomes more expensive to make the pizzas. And guess what's going to happen? Oh, we shifted everything to the left by two units. It's not as profitable. So therefore, we will cut back on the amount of pizza that we are willing and able to make. Beautiful. So that looks like this. Oh a decrease in supply and that means a shift to the left and again it is caused by an outside factor other than the price 
All right. Now we're getting a little short on time here. I don't want to rush through this. In fact, we'll probably have to go back and revisit a lot of this stuff on Thursday, just to, um, Friday rather, just to make sure we really understand it. It's too important to rush through it. So um, yeah, we'll wrap this up fairly quickly, but then we're going to go back and go through it all one more time, just to make 100% sure that everybody really understands what we've been doing, because we have to understand this before we go on and do anything else. All right, so the next step is to see what happens when we combine this with our demand curve. So um, let's, let me just, here we go. So here's the case where we have the new supply curve. The supply curve has gone up compared to the original supply curve. And instead of having an equilibrium price of 10 and a quantity of five, all of a sudden the equilibrium price is lower and the quantity is higher. And so in other words, if you look at this graph carefully, you'll see that when the supply curve increases or shifts to the right through an increase in supply, we have two very positive developments here. We have a lower price and a higher quantity. Now that's everything you could possibly hope for, isn't it? You can have more pizza and pay a lower price for it. All of that just because the tomato crop was so good this year. That's what we like to see, isn't it, as consumers? Yes, it is. In fact, we love to see this. <laughs> but sadly enough, what if there's bad weather in Italy and the tomato crop is ruined? Oh, no. That means the cost of making pizza will go up and the supply curve will shift to the left and we'll all be unhappy together because look what happens. Um, the price goes up from 10 to 12. Oh boy. And now we only have four pizzas instead of five. And so you can see this is a decrease in supply. And so as a result, two bad things are happening here. The price went up and the quantity went down. So that's like your worst case scenario. You have to pay more money to get less pizzas because the price of the tomatoes is so much higher now. So this is a disaster. In fact, in economics, when this kind of thing happens, this is just for your own benefit. We often call this a supply shock. Bad news for everybody. Okay, that's the worst case scenario. All right, so I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's stop right here. Now, I'd like to go back and revisit this again on uh, Friday, just because I wanna make 100% sure everyone's on the same page here, because if there's one topic that's more important than this, I don't know what it is. In economics, everything we do is ultimately based on supply and demand. So we have to get this straight right now. And then when we're ready, we'll move on to something else, okay? So, all right, in the meantime, I guess we'll knock it off here and I'll see you all on Friday, all right? Thank you, have a good rest Okay, of you're welcome. Thanks, Professor. Hello. Thank you. Later. Thank Bye. you, enjoy the rest of your day. Right. Thanks, you too.